Hey everyone, and the Linux Mint team just started updating their ISOs, or maybe by the time you're watching this, uh, Linux Mint 22.3 is already out. On the surface, it looks like a sort of small update, but there are plenty of really interesting things in there, and so I think it warrants a dedicated video. So we're going to take a look at everything new in Mint 22.3, and we're also going to take a look at our sponsor. So this video is sponsored by Proton Mail. You all know what Proton does. They are your end-to-end -end and zero-access encrypted suite of services, meaning that their email service cannot be read by anyone but you. They have clients for a lot of devices, including a Linux app and also mobile applications, and they give you all the tools you need to fight spam, to fight scams, to fight privacy-invasive stuff. They block trackers. They have basically all the features that you'd need to make sure that your email stays in your hands instead of being read by someone else, which is often the trade-off uh, when you use a free email services uh, from a big tech company like Google. I personally use Proton Mail and a lot of their other services. I'm a paid customer, which means I have access to a few more features than the free plan, but you can get started with a free account. You'll also get some storage space, you'll get a password manager, you'll get a VPN, you'll get contacts, calendars, you'll get a documents editor, a spreadsheets editor now. It is a fast-growing suite of services that is just fantastic fantastic. I use them myself. I love them. So as always, the link is down in the description. So Linux Mint 22.3. The first thing that you might notice is this brand new menu. The default layout has been changed a little bit. It's not a huge departure from the previous one. You've got your user here, some shortcuts there, all the system buttons here, the search bar at the bottom, which is auto-focused uh, when you click on the menu or when you press the super key, and of course your usual categories that switch on hover and the list of apps in each. But you can actually configure it quite a bit. You've got a configure option there, which lets you choose what you want to display. So you've got your home folder, your downloads, music, all the usual basic directories. You can switch on and off the sidebar, your avatar for your user. If you don't want that, you can actually regain a little bit of space. You can disable the favorites. Basically, you get to tweak everything. The appearance is also really manageable. You can switch the search bar at the top. You can position the buttons alongside the search bar, or if you prefer them uh, by default in the sidebar, a ton of stuff here. You can change the size of the category icons. You can decide to not use symbolic icons if you prefer having full colored ones, uh, like I think it was previously. You also have all those sizes you can change. You can select to use a custom icon and label here. If you don't want the Linux Mint logo, you can change the icon. By default, they'll just open an icon browser where you have plenty of options. And you also have changes to the behavior, which means if you don't like the uh, switch on hover categories, now you can decide to have to click them instead. You can enable the auto scroll, disable it. You have the keyboard shortcuts in there. In short, it is a big change for that menu. It's really good. You can also, of course, uh, resize it if you want to take it uh, up to a notch or take just a lot more space if you have plenty of apps. It's a good change. It won't blow you away because uh, I think most people just press the super key and start typing something. But it is still an interesting one. And I think it just gives you more options to use your system how you please. Also, keyboard navigation has been improved. It's now a lot more easier to navigate categories than apps by using the left and right keys and up or down to move uh, to some other place. It's just good. Now we also have changes to the file manager. Uh, in the preferences, you now have something for document templates, meaning you can create new document templates or at least go fetch them and add them to a list. So the way it works, you open an application, any application where you would want to create a new specific document template. For example, here in LibreOffice, I have a blank document. I'm going to save it as a template. I'm going to call it new text document. I'll save it to the my templates folder. Who cares? If you go into Nautilus, uh, Nemo, sorry, <laughs> Nautilus is the one for GNOME, you get to the preferences, document templates, and automatically it now has this new template for documents. And the way you create a new document is through this menu. So it just does let you manage all the templates and the documents that you might want to create through the right-click menu, either through this graphical interface, or you can just dump them, as usual, in the templates folder. But this was not immediately super legible, so now you have a graphical interface to go fetch a specific document and add it into the templates list. It's pretty good. Nemo also now lets you pause file operations. So when you're transferring a gigantic file or a long list of smaller files, it's going to take 30 minutes, but your drive is now slowing down like crazy. You can 
pause this, do something else, and resume the operation afterwards, which is nice, it just lets you get a little bit more agency on your system, always a good feature to have. Another change in Mint 22.3 is that it now handles keyboard layouts a lot better. They used to have their own library for this, they moved to a GNOME library instead, which lets them handle all of this way easier. So you can mix and match, for example, uh, input methods that are basic keyboard layouts, but you can also add IBUS input methods, like for example, Japanese input. And the keyboard applet also now supports that. And by the way, this is all being recorded on Wayland because yes, this change does mean that finally on Mint, when you use the Wayland session, you can switch keyboard layouts and actually not use the English keyboard layout. Because uh, yeah, that was a pretty small barrier to transitioning Mint to Wayland, because if you could only use an English keyboard layout, you were leaving out a lot of people behind. So this fix changes all of that. Now, on top of that, they also rebuilt a brand new virtual keyboard. You actually still have the previous one, if you prefer it, the onboard keyboard, but you now have the new virtual keyboard as well, which is this one up top. It looks a lot better. Uh, it also supports uh, keyboard layouts, uh, which is interesting for an on-screen keyboard, and it just is nicer, a bit easier to use, it's full screen by default compared to the previous one, which uh, was a bit more basic and a bit harder to use. This one is just much simpler, it just does what you would expect out of a virtual keyboard. I think it's a good change too. All in all, mostly useful for touch screens or touch devices, which I'm not sure are the most common uh, input method for Linux users, but it is a good change and it now makes the Wayland session a lot more efficient uh, and actually usable for anyone who's not using a English QWERTY keyboard. Now, Mint 22.3 also comes with a brand new app, which is this new system information application, which does what it says on the tin. Uh, it just gives you information about your system, so uh, the windowing system you're using, uh, the display server, so here it is, Wayland, but also all your usual info that already existed, but now you also have a bunch more information about specifically your USB controllers, the GPU that is in your computer, all the PCI ports and what is populating them, the BIOS itself, including some versions, uh, the motherboard, if there's one here, is obviously in a VM, so not everything will be complete. You also have access to all the system reports, if you want to set them up, and you have access to the crash reports as well, if there have been any crashes, and no crashes for me, in the time frame it took me to record all of this. Now, other desktops have had those systems for a while, for example, KDE has one that is actually a lot more complete in terms of what it displays. The thing is, what KDE displays is not very legible. Even when you look at, for example, the CPU, you basically get something that is spit out right from the command line. And a lot of those pages are exactly like that, which isn't the best. Mint has fewer information, but it is displayed in a much more legible way in a lot of cases, which I think tends to be better. So I would much rather them taking their time and crafting some nice visual pages instead of just doing it quickly like KD did, but this information is just not very accessible to users. Now granted, who needs to get into the big details of your OpenGL, OpenCL details and would need a very beautiful graphical interface? That's probably a small cross-section of people, but it's still nice to have something that is nicely laid out, easy to read, easy to copy. I think it's just a better way of approaching things than what KD has done, even though yes, KD has a lot more info. Still, in both cases, it is very useful information, specifically for debugging, for system administration. If you want to check why your GPU isn't running as it should, you can check that it's using the correct driver. If your BIOS hasn't received the right update, you can check that. And you don't need to use the terminal to look at that. The information can be copy-pasted and exported easily for use in forums and when you're asking questions. So I think it is a good change and a good tool to have. It just completes the entire suite of graphical tools that Mint tends to bring. They are probably one of the most complete graphical experiences in terms of not having to use the command line to get any information, and this keeps this trend going. 
Now, another tool that Mint added in 22.3 is this system administration tool. Now, currently, it doesn't do much. It's just editing the boot menu. It lets you choose if you want to see basically the grub menu itself, uh, the delay you want to see before you're booting the first entry, and remembering the last selected choice or not. It's basically grub options, but in a graphical way. And you can also add boot parameters in there, which is very nice to have that graphically I actually quite enjoy this tool and I think the idea is going to be adding more stuff in there as time goes on, as they get more sysadmin features. Now, it's not just from OpenSUSE, I'll give you that, but it is a good advancement for the distro. Again, moving on that front of giving you all the tools that you need for system administration and system management with a graphical user interface instead of having to rely on the command line. With this one, you can basically just edit your entire grab menu. It's easy to do. It's kind of safer than relying on a third-party app uh, that might or might not break your entire grub config. I think it's a good move. Now, there are plenty of other smaller changes in Linux Mint as well. The first one being that they expanded their selection of symbolic icons throughout the desktop. They actually made those icons for their X app. So you can see a bunch of them. Those are the monochrome uh, basic icons that are used in a lot of little menus and toolbars and stuff like that. The reason why they did that is that they previously used symbolic icons from Adwaita in a lot of places but uh, GNOME has really cemented the fact that Adwaita is just for GNOME, so they removed the icons that they themselves didn't need, and so obviously this meant that some applications in Mint lacked a bunch of applications and had errors, so they developed their own, they made their own, which means that now every app should have the right icons displayed at the right time. You can't really throw shade at GNOME for this. They are making their platform for GNOME, so they are only keeping the stuff that is useful for GNOME. They don't necessarily see Adwaita, Libadwaita, or the GNOME frameworks as something to build something else than GNOME. It's made for GNOME. So obviously when you rely on that and something disappears, it can be annoying, but that's why Mint developers are taking things into their own hands and building their own suite of tools, of apps, of icons, because, well, you can't really base yourself off of another's platform if what they want to build is not a platform accessible for every other desktop. They're building it for themselves, and so you have to kind of build your own or build on top of theirs. Another small change they made is that you can now decide to enable nightlight in an always-on fashion. It's not necessarily automatic, depending on the time of day or based on specific uh, start and end times. You can now have it always on. This will be reflected in the little applet here, which lets you turn it on or off at all times. So if you really don't want any blue light and you want to reduce that, then you can use nightlight to do just that. It's going to work fantastically. Now, of course, it's a new version of Mint with Cinnamon 6.6, and so they made changes to better support Wayland as well. So the window manager itself has received changes to make sure that the Wayland session is better. It is still experimental. It is labeled as such in the login manager, so it's not ready yet. But with the removal of the problem of keyboard layouts and the improvements that they made, I have no doubt that their Wayland session will be ready for the next major version of Mint, which will be based on Ubuntu 26.04, probably coming maybe in May, June, something like that. And at that point, I would expect the Wayland session to be the default. But of course, don't take my word on that. Min developers move at their own pace. What's sure is that the Wayland session in the time I used it felt quite good. Uh, you do have all the authentication prompts. You have the support for most portals that you would expect. You have keyboard layouts. So I would say probably now it's mostly usable, but I'm sure there are some edge cases here and there that aren't supported yet. Now, if you use the hot corners function which lets you just point your mouse pointer to a specific corner of the screen and uh, set a specific action to run at that point. You can now allow those hot corners uh, if you have applications full screened. Uh, you, they just didn't work previously. Now they're gonna work fine. That's a good change too. The Alt Tab switcher now also has a brand new option which lets you only show windows from the current monitor. So if you have multiple monitors and you really want to cycle through the windows that you're currently focusing on, then that's the option you need to check 
in the settings. Mint themes were also improved a little bit. You still have the default system, which lets you choose a style, an accent color, mixed, dark, or light mode. But if you go into the advanced settings, now when you take a look at themes, they are now uh, categorized with the exact theme that they come from. So you have all the Mint L themes with a little separator, all the Mint X and all the Mint Y themes. They are all nicely separated, so it's a bit easier than navigating a gigantic list of themes. I also think they reduced the size of each option. In If I remember correctly, they were much bigger, uh, so the list scrolled kind of endlessly. It's now a bit easier to identify, yes, I'm using Mint Y and I want the purple one. I'm going to click on this one. I think it's a little bit easier and a bit nicer. Although I did go into an issue where the list just doesn't really resize itself properly. So you're cut off at the bottom. Uh, maybe that's just a Wayland thing. So as usual with these intermediary Mint releases, you get smaller changes, but a few configuration options that will have their uses, a few improvements here and there that will fix an edge case or the use case of someone not being completely fulfilled. I think that's good. And we also have changes to some of the default Mint apps, for example, in TimeShift, which is the backup utility, you now have the option to pause a backup while it is being created. Once again, just like the uh, Nemo file operations, uh, play or pause option, it's just so you can let your disk breathe a little bit if you have to do something important, and then you resume it when you need to resume it. I think it's good. Now, Warpinator, the tool that lets you send files to other computers on the same network, it now supports IPv6, and it also now lets you send text messages to other computers, which is pretty cool as well. Finally, on the package management front, uh, Mint has made a few changes, not to this software manager specifically, but to the underlying tools. For example, if you click an apt URL that would uh, take you to installing multiple packages, well, now it does support installing multiple packages instead of just the first one in the list. And finally, when you're installing updates for Mint using the update manager, the little icon here will tell you if you need to reboot your computer for those updates to work properly. And that's about it for Mint 22.3. So as we've seen, it's a lot of smaller changes, but there's also that continued work on the Wayland session, more options, more graphical ways of doing stuff that you previously kind of had to use the terminal or find a third party graphical app. I think that's the direction that Mint always really went towards. It is just bringing you more graphical ways of doing stuff that traditionally on Linux, you would rely on the terminal to do to get quicker access to a list of devices, of your system information, of handling certain updates or installing multiple packages. They just give you graphical ways to do all of this. They're refining their applications and their desktop. They're bringing new options in to make sure that when you need to do something, you have a graphical way to do so. It's good. It's what people expect. It's why people keep recommending Mint as the gateway for, for example, Windows users, because this is probably the Cinnamon desktop, at least uh, a desktop that brings you the most graphical tools to achieve the things that you want to do graphically with a minimum number of bugs. And yes, I know the theme and styling might look a bit dated to some of you, but in terms of solidity of a robust system that gives you graphical ways to do stuff, I think Mint is still unmatched uh, with its Cinnamon edition at the very So the ISOs for Mint are updated. I recorded all of this on a VM with the latest uh, Mint 22.3 ISO, not with the beta ISO. You can give it a shot. And I'm pretty sure that by the time you're watching this, there will be a blog post on Mint's website explaining all of this, how to upgrade and all of that stuff. And me personally, I left a link in the description for you to go check out our sponsor, Tuxedo Computers. You all know about them by now. They make Linux, laptops, and desktop stuff that ships with Linux pre-installed, made with hardware that supports Linux really well. They actually develop and open source and upstream drivers for everything that they add on top of the main Linux systems to make sure that all the little light bars, the keyboard backlights, all of that stuff works properly. You can install any distro you want on those devices, and they're the only ones that I currently use. Everything you see from me is made on a Tuxedo laptop. All my gaming is done on a Tuxedo desktop and also a Steam Deck, of course. And they have options for everyone, all price points, all form factors, all power levels, plenty of keyboard layouts to choose from. They're really customizable. So go check them out using the link in the description. They're really, really solid. Anyway, this will conclude this video. I hope you enjoyed listening to it or watching it or whatever else. You know where 
where all the usual YouTube buttons are and where you should click them. There are plenty of links down in the description as well for you to go uh, check out the things I offer to patrons and YouTube members. Uh, it's a daily Linux podcast if you want that. And I guess that's it. So thank you all for listening and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.